Good evening, everyone. It sure is good to see you all tonight. I don't know what the saying is when it sprinkles on you while it's blatant sunlight outside, but it's the kind of day it is, and you know what? That's okay, because we're getting a little bit of moisture. We're also preparing ourselves for the embrace of summer. Oh. Anyway, we are continuing our series that we've been looking at tonight at background history, if you will, of things that are going on uh, particularly in the ending of the Old Testament, and then we're going to be very soon at the period between the Old and the New Testament. I hope that so far, as we've looked at the Assyrian and Babylonian empires and how they intersect with uh, the various accounts that we have in the Old Testament, I hope that you have seen how helpful it is to be familiar with what's going on in the world and in that area of the world, uh, just outside of the specific uh, I guess, environment of Israel and uh, what's going on inside the nation of God's people because God is using, as we've already seen, the events of world history and the politics and, you know, rise and fall of nations. He's using all of those things uh, throughout that time period to accomplish his will. And we even saw, as we talked about this morning, uh, God did the same thing. He acted in the same way, providentially, uh, during the time of Rome. And I would argue, although we don't have any prophecies or predictions or anything in the way that they did in the Old Testament or even the New Testament, he does still act the same way in terms of through his providence in the rise and fall of nations. So we're going to look tonight at another nation uh, that we are going to uh, examine. We looked at Babylon last week, if you remember, and Babylon is the one who takes Judah into captivity. They don't last for a whole long time, but they do accomplish this one thing of taking uh, Judah into captivity. That's the big thing that happens while they are in power. So we're going to move on from them then to the Persian Empire and to the return from the exile that Babylon initially uh, initiated. As always, please, if you have questions or comments, feel free to throw them out there. I'll be asking some questions as well. Now, there's a few things that are very interesting about the Persian Empire and uh, Persia in general as we're looking at them. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second, but the first thing that's interesting is, well, who is after Persia in terms of what we have recorded in the Old Testament? Anybody know? Is there any other empire that exists in the uh, area of the ancient Near East? Is there any other empire that comes to power before the end of the Old Testament? Do what? The Medes, but they are actually allies of the Persians. So that's, that's good. I'm glad you bring that up, though. They actually were originally allies of the Babylonians, and they switched sides when Persia begins to rise. We'll talk about them more in just a second. But... Sometimes it's called the Medo-Persian Empire because they work together. Anything else? Any other empires come to mind? The important thing for us to remember, or one of the important things for us to remember about Persia, this is where the Old Testament stops. In terms of timeline, if you will, the Old Testament, the last book of the Old Testament, and there are people who debate this, but I think there's good evidence to make this statement, at the very least, in terms of when it is set, but I believe when it was written too, the last book of the Old Testament is written while the Persians are still in charge. And then you have a few centuries, and then all of a sudden the New Testament begins to be written, and wow, Rome's on the scene, right? But in terms of history, a lot happens between Persia and Rome. But Persia is the last one that we see recorded in Scripture before we get in the New Testament and all of a sudden we're in the Roman Empire. So we're going to look at the Persians tonight, but then starting next time, or I guess not next week, but two weeks from now, because next week's our uh, birthday anniversary fellowship, but starting next time we're going to start digging into what's going on in the background between the Old and the New Testament. Because as we've alluded to in some other classes, that is extremely relevant for where we're at once the New Testament starts. But we're going to talk about the Persian Empire because that's where we wrap up. That's where everything kind of ends in terms of the record of the Old Testament. Now, once again, using this map here, we see the Fertile Crescent like we've been looking at several of these times. 
notice we have Nineveh up here, uh, kind of on the north of this river. We have Babylon over here on the other river. And then here, this is the city of Susa. Susa would be one of the main cities or capital cities of the Persian Empire. There was some uh, variation, you know, uh, think about, for example, uh, how many capitals has America had in its history, right? We've had at least Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia that both come to mind. I want to say there was one or two other ones uh, very briefly in our history, but at least those two at a certain point were the capitals. Well, uh, you have the same thing with Persia. It did shift a little bit, but the main one that we hear about, at least in Scripture and in a lot of inscriptions, is this city of Susa. Notice, all three of these empires that had such an impact on Israel towards the end of the, New or of the Old Testament, rather, they're all in that same area, between or near these two rivers, Tigris and Euphrates, and they all come in and invade along this crescent area coming down, and usually it is either to attack Egypt, and so they have to go through Canaan to attack Egypt, or they're just expanding that direction and they've already conquered Egypt and they conquered Judah in the process. Either way, it's very interesting kind of both the placement of Canaan and the location of these different nations. A few weeks ago, if you remember in Revelation, we talked about this idea of the Euphrates being a border for invading armies. Well, this is why, because that's all Israel had ever known is the Euphrates being where their enemies come from in terms of those who would take them into captivity and so forth. So we see this uh, as far as the location of the city. As far as the extent of the empire, if you remember, as we looked uh, last week and the week before, Assyria centered kind of over here. It occupied a pretty good chunk kind of in here. Babylon occupied a slightly smaller chunk. Persia, as you can see, extends very widely off this map, <laughs> a lot further east, for example, potentially all the way to India. There's some a little bit of uncertainty as far as exactly how east the Persian Empire, far east the Persian Empire went, uh, but certainly at least the borders of India it would have reached. It goes all through Mesopotamia, Canaan, modern-day Turkey, even some parts of Greece, and we'll talk about that more in a minute as well, and into northern Africa, Egypt, and so forth. This was contrary to the Assyrian and Babylonian empires, a massive empire and a very stable one as well. As we talked about last time, Babylon did not last very long, and mainly the height of their power centered around one king, Nebuchadnezzar, who of course is talked about a lot, especially in places like Daniel. It centers a lot on that one king, and his leadership ability, and once he's gone, that empire quickly falls apart. That's not the case with Persia. Persia lasts, in fact, for about two centuries at a pretty steady level of power. It wouldn't be taken down until Alexander the Great himself brings it to his knees. So we have a very different situation with Persia than with these other two nations, Although it's interesting that these other two nations are the ones who take first the northern kingdom of Israel and then the southern kingdom of Judah into captivity, it's going to be Persia that actually decides their fate because they are the ones who actually take over everything after those comparatively short-lived empires go their own way. Now, remember last week we talked about the walls of Babylon? 320 feet tall, uh, perhaps as much as 80 feet wide, 56 miles in circumference around the city, ridiculous fortifications, especially for the ancient world with a lack of technology as we think of it. They had, you know, some technology of their day, but it wasn't anything like what we have. Just a massive undertaking. How on earth do you take a city like that? How would Persia bring Babylon to its knees with those kind of fortifications? Well, we gave a little sneak peek last night, or last time, right, that they didn't actually lay siege to it, really. What happened? Well, Persia is beginning to uh, be on the rise. Babylon is beginning to see them as a threat. But something weird happened. You have a king who is in charge of Babylon uh, shortly after Nebuchadnezzar. His name is Nabonidus. Based on all the records that we have, Nabonidus didn't really like his job. And that may sound funny. How does a king not like being king? Well, 
try it sometime, you'll probably understand, right? But he doesn't really like all the statesman, you know, statesman's job and, and everything he has to do. And so he's kind of just AWOL a lot. He kind of just travels different places and is doing like, I don't remember if it was some kind of like scientific research or if he's like doing some kind of library building. I don't think it was library building, but it was something along those lines where he's doing some kind of like, kind of a hobby, if you think about it from his perspective, of some kind of study or research or something like that. And so he leaves someone else in charge, if my memory serves correctly, and uh, forgive me because this slipped my mind all of a sudden, but I believe his son uh, is the one in charge. Anyone have a guess what his son's name is? Belshazzar. Belshazzar is mentioned in scripture, although Nabonidus is not. And you might be saying, well, why does it say King Belshazzar if Nabonidus is king? Well, because for all intents and purposes, he let his son take the throne while he did whatever he wanted to do. That is at least what historians seem to indicate uh, from the records that we have. So although Belshazzar technically is not the one in charge in terms of the literal hierarchy, for all intents and purposes, he's in charge because his dad doesn't want the job. Well, what happens if you are a king, or rather if you are a prince, and your dad, the king, doesn't want anything to do with being the king, and all of a sudden you have access to the, uh, the resources of an empire? And you're a young man with probably not the best upbringing in terms of morality and so forth. What do you think he does? Well, exactly what we see in Daniel chapter 5, right? He throws a party. Why wouldn't you? You're the prince. You have access to all this stuff. We're going to throw a party. And so what happens? Well, he throws this feast for all his nobles and lords. They're drinking wine. They're praising the gods of gold and silver. All these things happen. And then Daniel tells us, these fingers of a human hand start writing on the wall. That is, I don't know if we stop and think about it sometimes, and, and we'll talk about this when we get to Daniel, so I don't want to go down this road, but that is just one of the most unique ways for God to both scare and communicate at the same time. Like, I don't know that I would ever have thought of something like that, just by my own imagination, like, what, what, how, how is God going to shock you into uh, realizing something or coming to your senses? Uh, okay, a disembodied hand writing on a wall. That, that's, that's one way, right? But anyway, this is the, exam, or the uh, uh, instance, the account that we're familiar with of the writing on the wall. Daniel comes in, he interprets this. And it's interesting, notice what happens in the aftermath of that. If you remember, even in the text, although Nabonidus' name is not mentioned, Belshazzar tells Daniel, because you have done this, because you have interpreted this dream, I am going to elevate you to third in the kingdom. Well, why not second in the kingdom? Because he was second. Very good. Again, although we don't have, you know, all the names explicitly, the Bible's purpose is not necessarily to give us every detail of the ancient history of Babylon, but it's still is very accurate with what we know of Babylon. So I find that very interesting. So he makes him third in command, if you will. They're all partying. They're all doing all this kind of stuff. Belshazzar is obviously impressed, but he also obviously doesn't take Daniel's prediction that Babylon is going to fall very seriously because guess what's happening while they're in here partying? Babylon is a city with these giant walls, but they have to have water, right? We mentioned this last week. They had a river running through the city. So they're never going to be without water. This is a very substantial river. It was, I believe, a, a tributary of the Euphrates. I don't know that it was the Euphrates itself. It could have been, I can't remember. Either way, they have a very substantial river running through the city. So Persia diverted the flow of the water. All of a sudden there's a gap where the water would run into the city. They did have gates that they would put up to block that gap, if you will. But for some reason or another, the gates were open and unguarded while everyone's partying with Belshazzar. So while Belshazzar is partying, as is recorded for us in Daniel, the Persians are sneaking in through the water gate. And we're told in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, that just as Daniel predicted, that very night, 
Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Well, that's what happened. The Persians snuck in, killed this king in name, at least, right? The, the, the prince. Killed the prince, take the city of Babylon without really much of a fight, and all of a sudden, Babylon is not really a, a power anymore because their chief city and whatever you want to say about their king and their leadership, not really present anyway, uh, is now taken completely out of the way. And so Persia takes over. It's interesting, and I'll, I'll again, we'll address this in Daniel, but Darius the Mede, going back to what Phyllis said earlier, I'm glad she brought that up. Most likely, when it says he received the kingdom, most likely he was put in charge of Babylon specifically, meaning he was in charge of the former kingdom of Babylon, because Cyrus is the name of the king of the whole empire at large. So that's probably what's being described here. Anyway, all that being said, that's where we go from Babylon being in charge to Persia being in charge. That's how we have that transition. And I think it's very, very interesting and really cool that we have a major part of how that transition happened given to us and kind of showing us a little bit of behind the curtain uh, in Daniel, although of course the main point is not to give us all that history. We still have it present there in a very large degree. So what's Persia known for? Well, first of all, this is a tomb, as you can probably tell, uh, memorializing, if I can say the word, uh, Cyrus, King Cyrus, who we just mentioned. Now Cyrus is mentioned in scriptures, we'll show in a second, but he was the one under whom Persia really rose to uh, the height of, uh, or the level of empire, maybe we should say. Uh, under him, Babylon falls. Under him, uh, the uh, empire is kind of uh, established, it is firmly in control of the Persians, uh, with, of course, the help of the Medes. Again, they were allies working together. That's why it's sometimes called the Medo-Persian Empire. Cyrus did a whole, whole lot uh, in accomplishing that, but... Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who pretty much did a lot of the same things, but then died and no one really picked up the mantle, Cyrus had a whole lot of very successful successors who were able to keep the empire together for centuries afterward as well. But Cyrus is the main one we'll talk about, um, at least at first, because of his influence uh, in starting, if you will, or... Uh, bringing the Persian Empire to power, but also because of what he's going to do uh, for the Jews and their history, as we'll look at in a moment. Another thing that we want to look at as we are thinking about the Persian Empire, something that made them different. How do you think an empire, a government, let's say, for lack of a better term, how do you think a government can maintain control of its population? If you have a small area... For example, uh, you have uh, some of these Greek philosophers, right? They wrote about the, the perfect government, the perfect uh, uh, political system. Well, they lived in city-states, right? Basically, a city and the surrounding area, that's the area that you have to work with. Well, you can have one person or one you know, small government body, and they can control that area pretty easily. What about if we're talking empire size? Can just one person by themselves govern all that? No, that's not how it works. So what do you have to have then in order to keep an empire under control? Do what? Good men. Okay. You have to have a good, a good organized hierarchy that works to keep the government of the entire area functioning properly. Assyria and Babylon, they weren't idiots, right? They knew that you need that, but they didn't have a very well-organized system for keeping everyone in control. Their main philosophy, and especially the Assyrians, we can understand this, right? Their main philosophy was be scared of me. If you misbehave, I'll cut your tongue out and your eyes out and all that, right, that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Yeah, that, that doesn't work very well. Fear 
only goes so far to keep people in line. Eventually, they get tired of being afraid of you, and as we see with Assyria, they kick you out. Babylon, although they weren't as cruel as Assyria was, they also had a similar uh, uh, way of thinking about things in terms of, uh, you know, we're going to intimidate and all these kind of things, but even they didn't have a super well-organized government system, bureaucracy, uh, to actually maintain order across a large empire. And it didn't last for very long. Persia was different. Persia, they figured out how to make an empire work. That's one of the reasons they lasted so long. They would divide their empire into multiple sections. They called them satrapies. So uh, the satraps or satraps uh, who were essentially governors of these areas, they would be in control, and then you'd have a hierarchy under them. They all reported back to the king, and then you have uh, just a very well-organized structure. This picture up here, probably wondering why it's up here, this is a picture of the king, and it's not great resolution, I apologize, but this is a picture of a king. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be Cyrus or not, but it's one of the Persian kings with one of his satraps, one of the people in charge of the various areas, what we would call probably provinces. Um, he's in charge of one of the various areas of the empire. That system worked incredibly well, and in some ways, we might even suggest, was very similar to what Rome would eventually do in their empire in instituting provinces with the governors and uh, you know, proconsuls and all those kinds of things. Uh, I think that's the right term uh, that they would use to organize their empire. So that's one of the reasons why uh, Persia was able to create such a stable system for so long. The other aspect of it is also very interesting, though. Remember what Assyria and Babylon's uh, philosophy was is you know, we're, we're going to try and intimidate people, we're trying, going to try and scare them, we're going to try and undermine any means of uh, resistance, and we're going to try and enforce our way of thinking, our way of life. Well, part of what they did in order to accomplish that, both Assyria and Babylon, they would take conquered peoples and transplant them to areas they were not familiar with. So, for example, that's why... Assyria and Babylon took Israel and Judah into captivity because their policy, if we capture a nation and leave them where they were, well, they have home field advantage, right? They know the area, they know the terrain, they have connections with each other all in this area. So we'll transplant them to another place. They lose a lot of their cultural connections. They lose a lot of their identity. And hopefully we can make them into more of our identity, our culture in the process, that's their philosophy. Now, granted, that just makes people more upset, but it also makes them more afraid, right? That's, that's the way they think. Persia had a complete opposite philosophy. This is called the Cyrus Cylinder. It is a, I don't want to call it a manuscript because it's on stone, but it is a document, if you will, a stone uh, a record, you can see all the writing on it, in, uh, I believe, I can't remember what language this would be, but uh, the language of Persia. And basically what you would have uh, on this document, on this, this uh, cylinder, is a record of Cyrus, his rule, what he did, but one of the main things that this records is his foreign policy, or his policy of peoples that had previously been conquered. He had... A very different approach. Yes, we want people to have a certain degree of fear if they rebel against us, but that's not going to be our main philosophy for how to make people loyal, they decided. We're going to send people who have been transplanted back to their old homeland. We're going to let them return to the worship of their native gods. We're going to let them return to the practices of their native culture. And that'll make them happy. That'll make us seem like liberators. And they'll be much more likely to be loyal. Just purely from a policy standpoint, it's kind of genius, right? This is a pretty good way, if you're going to try and manage a large empire, of getting people to like you and to view your, your power, your government, positively. 
Well, interestingly enough, although the Jews are not specifically mentioned in the Cyrus Cylinder, this exact policy is recorded as it related to the Jews who have been taken captive. In Ezra, we have this recorded as well as in Chronicles, and maybe in Kings, I can't remember. But we have this recorded for us in Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Remember, Jeremiah told Israel they would be captives for about 70 years, and then they would be allowed to return. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation. Whoever is among you, and this is kind of part of the proclamation, of all his people, he is speaking to Israel, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Now, we read this, and without context, we might say, wow, was Cyrus a believer in the one true God? Was he a worshiper of the one true God? No, I, I hate to burst your bubble, but Cyrus was a pagan just like everyone else of his time in the uh, nations of Syria, Babylon, Persia. He was no more a God worshiper than any of the others. But he has a a smart way of dealing with people who have been made captive. This is not the only nation that he says, go back, rebuild your temples, restore the worship of your native gods, etc., etc. This is what he did for all the enslaved peoples. But we have the record in Scripture of him doing this for Israel. And this accomplishes, through God's providence, once again, his purpose of bringing back a remnant to the land of Israel. And of course, we see in Ezra and in Nehemiah, that's exactly what happens. Over the next several decades, multiple waves of Israelites, they come back to their homeland, the promised land, and they begin to restore the worship of God, to rebuild uh, the temple, to rebuild the city, all because of a change in powers and in policy that God uses in his providence to accomplish this. I hope we're seeing, once we kind of understand the background of what's going on, it is incredible how we can see God's hand at work in these events. God using these uh, various aspects of, again, politics, kingdoms rising and falling and so forth, to accomplish his purpose. We also see in uh, Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 1, as we said, multiple waves. So Ezra and the people that went with him, they were at a certain point in time. This is later than that. He again, Nehemiah that is, he is going to come before the king at that time, and he is going to lead even more people back uh, to the land of Israel to rebuild the wall. And it's interesting, Nehemiah, he is actually the cupbearer, which was a very trusting position, because if you're the cupbearer, that means you drink a little bit before the king to make sure it's not poison. That's one of your duties. And therefore, you've got to be a trustworthy person in order to do that, Number one, you're putting your life on the line for the king. And number two, the king is watching you, watching uh, your response, your reaction to different things. Uh, and so it's interesting. Uh, we see him, Nehemiah, being sad in the king's presence. And he's sad because of the, uh, the state of Israel at this point. And, well, I could go on a tangent there. But anyway, it's an interesting uh, interchange between the king and Nehemiah. But ultimately, Nehemiah is able to, because of the trust he has gained, uh, get the king's permission to lead more people back and rebuild uh, the, uh, uh, the temple and the walls and everything like that. So we have Ezra and Nehemiah both taking place in this time period while Persia is in charge, and they are able to take advantage of this change in policy to allow them to restore uh, the land of Israel and the uh, worship of the one true God. We also see Esther, another key book that is set very, uh, very completely, I don't know how else to say that, uh, in the time of Persia's reign. We have the first verse, or first two verses, of Esther. It says, now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned, okay, I guess we do have some records of India, reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. I guess it doesn't say he reigned part of India, but at least he reigned to the border of India. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, remember that city we pointed out, the citadel. Now notice a couple of things here. 127 provinces 
I believe the translators have kind of tweaked that for us. That would be called satrapies uh, in Persian uh, language, but uh, for us, we would think of them more as provinces. But he reigns over this area. Anyone know another name for Ahasuerus? Xerxes. Xerxes. Why is that name familiar to us? I mean, a lot of people in ancient times, kings or not, had multiple names. Why is Xerxes significant? Anybody know? Again, this is why some background kind of helps us see what's going on. There's this king in charge in Persia. He is, as we read the story of Esther, he is going to ultimately marry a Jewish woman uh, that's going to be instrumental in saving the Jews from their enemies uh, who don't like them in among the, the, the powerful people in Persia. But we have this story. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about Esther, but I know that's been ages ago now, right? So Esther, or rather Xerxes, he is starting this banquet, right? He's starting this feast. He's giving a feast for his officials, for his servants. Notice how it's worded. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces. Why would you call an army to a feast? There's really two reasons, right? One reason you might call an army to a feast is... You've just won a victory, and you're celebrating. No indication of that. What's the other reason you might call an army together for a feast as a king? You're getting ready to go to war. Whether it is getting ready to defend against invasion, or, in this case, getting ready to invade. And guess where Xerxes is invading? If we match up all the timelines, again, why it's so cool to begin to see all these pieces of the biblical record in their historical background, this is the invasion where Xerxes tries to take down Greece. This is where things like the Battle of Thermopylae, remember the 300 Spartans holding that pass against a massive Persian army? That's this king. That's this war. Also, the Battle of Marathon, where eventually uh, Persia would be defeated. It's very interesting because ultimately what we see, this is a, a rough artist's depiction, but it's an artist's depiction of the Battle of Thermopylae that's become so famous. But part of what makes this interesting is that why would Xerxes be so interested in the book of Esther, especially in Esther chapter 2, why would he be so interested in expanding his harem and finding a beautiful queen? Well, if you just lost a huge war, that's something that kings of his time would do. You make yourself feel better with wine, women, and song, right? That's the background of the book of Esther. And again, we see that as historical background, and it makes a lot of sense. One more thing, and then we'll wrap up. Daniel, chapter 8. This is moving into the more prophetic side of Daniel with the visions and the apocalypses and so forth, rather than the uh, more uh, record of just like different events in Daniel's life. We see Daniel setting the stage for the next empire that's going to come. Persia is in charge at this time. Remember, Persia takes over, oh, we're talking the late 500s uh, B.C., and they stay in power until about 300, late 300s BC, so about 330, 340, somewhere in there. So again, about 200 years, the Persian Empire will remain in power. But Daniel, he predicts in the book of Daniel, the next empire that will come to be. It is referred to in Daniel as the Empire of Greece. We usually refer to it also as the Empire of Greece. Technically, it would be of Macedon, but same difference. Ultimately, this is predicting the next kingdom is going to rise, but that doesn't happen until after the Old Testament's over. It happens between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So what we see with Persia, Persia is in control very soon after the captivity. Persia is the one who lets the Israelites go back from captivity. Persia is in control during all this time while the city is being rebuilt, while worship is being restored. Also, during all the events of the book of Esther, 
And Persia will remain in control for many decades after the last book of the Old Testament is written. But even the Old Testament predicts there's going to be things that happen after Persia. And that's what we're going to get to next time as we begin to see all the events that lead up from the end of the Old Testament and where we end with Persia being in control, how we get from there to both the state of the world at the time of Jesus, also the state of the Jews specifically at the time of Jesus. Because as we've talked about a little bit before, if we don't understand a lot of what shaped the Jewish mind by the time we get to Christ's day, we're not going to really have a clear picture of why people responded to Jesus as he did and why he responded to the Jews as he did. Because so much that happens between Persia and Rome, in particular, shapes the Jews' mindset towards the idea of a Messiah and towards uh, the general idea of how to deal with nations outside of the Jews. That's going to be very, very significant as we move forward. But for now, as we look at the Persian Empire, again, we see them being used as a providential tool of God, this time to return Israel to their homeland, as well as uh, being a stable force, if you will, to allow some rebuilding up until the end of the, New Testa or the Old Testament and even beyond. Any thoughts, questions, comments, confusions as we wrap up for this evening? Well, as always, if you do have something that comes up, feel free to ask. You all know I love talking about history, maybe a little too much. But uh, we will continue that in a couple weeks, uh, and uh, looking forward to that. As always, we have uh, the invitation open for anyone who uh, would need to uh, ask for prayers or, or help in any way. Uh, we always uh, uh, encourage you to, to do that, whether it be uh, asking for prayers from, from everyone or just uh, approaching someone privately at some point. We, we just want to be here for one another. If there is something we can help you out with, please let us know as we stand and sing together. There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. When the saints have